Well, good evening. It's good to be here with you guys. My name is Robert Smith. I'm one of the pastors here, and I encourage you to open to the book of Luke, chapter 12. It's where we're going to be at today. If you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to use one of the Bibles in the chair around you. you we're uh, going to be on page 1035 uh, as we do that. And as we get started, i got a question for you. What are you afraid of? Uh, because at some level, we all have fear. And, you know, it's, as kids, it starts with being afraid of the dark or being afraid of the closet door being opened, but then it progresses into bigger and scarier things, right? We're afraid of bigger things like spiders and snakes and heights and open water, and we're afraid of needles and medical things. We're afraid of these things. Uh, and, and all around us, we see fear. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Joe was preaching, shared about the, the fear of public speaking and how that can limit sometimes our prayer life and activity. Uh, but we all see and experience fear. And sometimes it's the normal stuff like what I just listed. Sometimes it's some of these odd ones that I found, like somnophobia, the fear of sleeping. Uh, I have never experienced that one myself. Uh, there's also ombrophobia, the fear of rain, which uh, up until a couple of weeks Weeks ago, Havasu is a great place to live if that was you. Uh, the last couple of weeks, not so much. There's also cyberphobia, the fear of eating. Uh, so all these strange ones uh, that can pop up in our life and, and, and interact with how we see and, and view the world. But see, there's other fears as well that, that maybe are a little less easy to joke about and, and to talk about, like the fear of failure. The fear of failure that can keep us from, from taking the bold step that we need to and stepping into something new and interesting because we're too afraid that it's not going to work out. Or maybe it's the fear of, of getting hurt in relationships so we don't live open and vulnerable with the people around us so we actually never experience what we're looking for because we never open ourselves up. Or maybe it's the fear of change. So we keep living with the status quo even though that actually keeps us from experiencing the new life that we want to find. See, whether it's the easy things like being afraid of snakes or the big things like being afraid of hurt in relationships, there's fear that interacts with our life. And, and today what I want to do is I want to look at Luke chapter 2 with us, or 12 rather, together is, and look at what Jesus has to say about fear and, and how we can have, I hope, a healthier view of, of fear and the things that are around us uh, and a better understanding of how to lean into faith in God through that. So let's take a look. Uh, Luke chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 4 here together, and it says this. It says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows." And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers of authorities, don't be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. See, as we look at, at Jesus speaking on this issue of fear and, and how we approach our life, there's a few things that, that I think he's presenting to us. And the first is that we should not live for the approval of people. He says, don't, don't live for the approval of the people around you. And he says this by saying, hey, don't be afraid of people. Uh, don't be afraid of what they can do. And now this, this could be taken of just like, hey, don't be afraid of the physical things that people can do to you. But I think Jesus is talking about something bigger than that. It's bigger than just being afraid of the guy with a gun who's trying to mug you in the convenience store. He's talking about the fear of people that actually shows up in our life each and every day. He's talking about the, our tendencies to fear rejection and judgment and abandonment and condemnation. He's talking about those tendencies for us to change how we live because of how we fear people. And we, see, we, we live in a fear of people when we do things like 
changing our opinion or perspective so that we simply align with someone else and agree with them and can get that, yeah, we're on the same team. We do this when, when we do things and agree to things we don't really want to do just so we don't have to say no and face the, that awkward moment with the people around us. We do this when we pretend to know about something that we really have no idea what we're talking about simply so we don't get the judgment of not being adequate or knowledgeable. We do this when we connect our happiness to how, thing, how people think about us and how social media interacts with us or the, the praise that we get at work for our performance. These are all ways that we live for the approval of people and at some level they're all connected to us being afraid of how they will treat us. And Jesus speaks to this by going to the extreme. He goes to the extreme and says, hey, you're worried about the judgment, the condemnation, the, the ways it could make your life difficult. And he's like, what's the worst that could happen? They kill you? Now, we're sitting here just in that isolator. We're like, yeah, that's a big deal, Jesus. But when you continue in his logic, he says, hey, there's something bigger here. There's more to the story than just our physical life here. He's saying there's more to our existence than just our life, and when we live for the approval of people, when we fear that, we lose our perspective. And he says, hey, there's something more significant. And that is that our life isn't just life here, but it's the life here and our life in eternity with him and how we're preparing for that. But see, when we focus just on the approval of people, we lose all that perspective. And a couple of weeks ago, I, as I was starting to prepare for this and thinking through this, I remembered a situation that hap- happened a couple months back. And uh, it was an evening. I had just gotten home. We're getting ready for like family dinner time. And I took out my phone and I saw a message. It was on my phone. It was about a situation that was kind of developing. And this person was mad at me. They were accusing me of, of being at fault in this situation. It was incredibly harsh and, and hurtful what they said. And I was mad. I was hot. I read it and I'm like, are you kidding me? And I walked into the kitchen and I showed it to my wife, Amber. I'm like, look at this. Can you believe what they said? And she went, okay. I'm like, what do you mean, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, let me back up. And you, do you remember this situation? So I started at the beginning, shared all this. And I'm like, now look at this. And she's like, okay. And now I'm mad that she's not mad. Um, <laughs> And everything's just going sideways on me. But her reaction caused me to go, oh, maybe I need to step back from this a little bit. Because I started to see like, what was going to happen to our evening and how I was going to make our family dinner time really not all that fun for anyone but me and ruin everything over this little message that was on my phone. So thankfully, I stepped back, put the phone aside. We had dinner. I'm internally still brewing a little bit, but trying not to show it. And later I go back, I have a much more calm and uh, less destructive response than what I wanted to. But here's a really interesting thing. God brought this to my memory a couple weeks ago, and this situation happened maybe two months ago total. And as I remembered it, I couldn't remember what the message was. I could remember my response. I could remember the the anger that I had, my temptation to kind of ruin everything around me and even my desire to, to, to bite back at them. But I had to pull out my phone and actually go digging to find out what did they say that made me so mad? Because in the grand scheme of things, it really didn't matter. Because here I was just six or so weeks later, I couldn't remember the words that, that totally derailed everything for me. Because when we, when we focus just on the approval of the people around us, we lose perspective of the big picture. And that's what Jesus is trying to point out here. He's like, hey, in the grand scheme of your life and eternity, the, the approval of the people around you doesn't matter. And really, when we look at it, even in the, the perspective of, of a year or so of our life, it doesn't matter but yet we get so focused on it. We, we, we allow it to, to completely derail our life and we lose perspective. Now, I'm not saying that, that the people that are in our life can't cause real and, and, and hurtful damage in our life, but what I'm saying is the things that we allow to build up really aren't as big a deal as we think they are in the moment. We lose perspective on the fact that that living for the approval of people is more significant than it really is. And when we do that, we downplay the significance of living for God. 
and focusing on his approval, and that's exactly what he brings up for us. See, as we keep reading, he, he, he points out, he's like, no, fear the one who has all authority over not just your life here, but also your eternity, which shows us that, that what we need to do instead is to live with a healthy fear of God. See, he says, hey, fear the one who has authority over not just your life here, but, but the rest of your eternity as well. Yeah, fear that one. And all throughout the Bible, we see these instances of fearing God show up. There's somewhere I read, there's, there's over 300 references or, or uh, kind of examples of this. And a few to, to share directly about this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Psalm 33, 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord, that all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. See, all throughout the Bible, we see this over and over again, either us being told to fear God or it talking about people fearing the Lord. And so here, as is, is Jesus says, yes, fear the one who has all authority in your life, I want us to pause and say, what does that mean? What does it mean to fear God? Because if we just take it at a shallow surface level, it's like, so I'm to be afraid of God? Because it seems inconsistent to say that we're to live with like this fear and anxiety and trembling over the one who says he's saving us. So, so what does it mean to fear God? Well, I think when we look at, at Jesus' statement here in Luke 12, it shows us that we start with understanding he is the perfect, holy, and righteous judge who has the authority to, to issue the sentence of condemnation that we earned. We've earned an eternity in hell based on our works here on earth. And God, as that holy, perfect, and righteous judge, has every right to say, hey, here's your sentence of condemnation. But grace shows up. But love shows up. God loves and shows compassion and mercy toward us, and so that changes the storyline when he sends his son Jesus to save us. So now we have a perfect, holy, and righteous judge who instead is finding a way for us to be forgiven and to receive mercy and forgiveness. So to fear God starts with understanding, hey, he has the authority to condemn us to hell because of what we've done. And so if we're not a believer in Jesus, there should be some fear and trembling of the Lord's. But when we step into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, that fear and trembling turns to honor and respect and gratitude and love over the one who had the ability to, to issue pain in our life and instead gives us grace and mercy. And so to fear the Lord is for us to say, God, I love you, I honor and respect you, and I want to live with obedience to you in my life. So today, as we, as we look at that, let me ask you, are you living for the approval of people, whether that's yourself or the people around you, or are you living for the approval of God? Because we are, we're presented here, the, the, the tension between these two things, they can't both exist. And if we want to fear the Lord, we have to live for his approval. We have to live with that desire to say, hey, I care about what you think, God, more than anything else. So are you living for the approval of people or for the approval of God? Some ways that you can, you can figure this out is by looking at what motivates you. Is it the, the applause or the attaboys of the people around you? Is it the recognition or the money that comes from doing something? Is it from the affirmation and congratulations of people when you achieve something? Or is your motivation to honor and live for the one who saved you? To say, hey God, I want to live for you. I want to glorify you with my life. And this is something that only you and God can, can really answer. I can't s stand in your life and say, hey, this is who you're living for, what you're doing. But I encourage you to ask that question. Who are you living for? Are you living for the applause, the approval of people, or the applause and affirmation of the Lord? Because really, only living for God gives us what we're looking for, gives us the joy and satisfaction that we crave. 
So with that, let's look at the results of fearing God. Jesus says, hey, here, don't fear people. Don't live for the approval of people. Instead, fear God and live for his approval. So where does that lead us? What are the results of doing that? So the first one we see is salvation. I want us to, to go back to, to the passage here uh, in verse eight. It says this, it says, I tell, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will also be denied before the angels of God. What he's telling us here is that, that fearing God is to trust in him and to step into that life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's to step into that place where it says, hey, I've received forgiveness, my life is changed, and I am boldly declaring that with my life. I am living that out and proclaiming that, and that is my identity, that is who I am, that is where I belong now. But if we're in that place where we're not choosing to actually proclaim and live that out, he's saying, hey, maybe you should question if that's actually real and active in your life. See, it reminds me of of Romans 10. It says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, it says that, that our faith starts internally and moves externally. So if you've experienced salvation, if you've stepped into a life changing relationship with Jesus, are you living that out? And if you're not sure, here's a couple of things to say, hey, have I done this? First, have you told someone? Have you said, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus? Have you had a conversation that says, hey, this is the decision I've made. This is the identity I now carry. This is where I'm headed with my life. Second, have you been baptized? See, baptism doesn't save us, but it's that outward declaration of our inward decision to follow Jesus. And you can do this any weekend in that tub right there, or as Pastor Chad mentioned, we've got a lake baptism coming up in a couple weeks on August 21st. That's a great opportunity for you to say to the world, to your church, your friends, your family, I'm a follower of Jesus. But the third thing to ask is, does my life look different now because of Jesus? Does your life look different? Are you living in a way where you're saying, hey God, I give you every area of my life. I give everything over to you. You change it. You shape it how you want. You give me something new to live for. See, do the people around you recognize that your life is different now that you have Jesus than it was before you had Jesus? If not, maybe you're not publicly living out your faith. See, when we stand in the fear of God, we receive salvation, but secondly, it says that we receive forgiveness. Keep reading, it says in verse 10, it says, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So Jesus says, hey, if you fear God, you will find forgiveness you will find forgiveness for the sins that you commit. And it sounds like it's the same thing as salvation, but this is the ongoing thing because we're gonna continue to mess up. We're gonna continue to sin. We're gonna continue to fall short. And when we fear God, we're, we're aware of that. We're aware of our sin and our shortcomings. We're also aware of the grace and forgiveness that's available. And so Jesus is saying, hey, when you sin against me, if you fear God, you're going to receive forgiveness. But some of you are like, okay, but what about the last half of that verse? Are you just going to ignore that? No, I'm not. So, Because at the end there, Jesus says that there's a sin that won't be forgiven. So we've got to pause for a second and talk about the unpardonable sin. That kind of elusive, mysterious thing within Christianity that we're always like, what's it mean? You know, what, what is it? Because in in Matthew 12, Mark 3, and Luke 12, Jesus talks about this sin that won't be forgiven. It's the sin of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And again, there's so many different theories out there and people trying to strategize and explain it. Because some will say that, oh, it's just a really bad sin. It's like murder or adultery or like that, that like top level sin. And I don't think that's it. Because all throughout the Bible, God uses stories of murderers and adulterers who receive forgiveness and God uses to accomplish great things. So I don't think that's it. 
Some people will say, oh, well, it's teaching heresy and, and, and you know, doctrine that's not true. And I personally don't think it's that because I think that's too vague and not specific enough. And honestly, it's too easy to do accidentally for it to, to line up to this. But the perspective I take is that it is the, the consistent and intentional ignoring of God in your life. It's someone persistently choosing to reject God and his grace. So the thing that, that makes it unforgivable is saying, hey, I know about God and I don't care. I know about God and know about the goodness uh, of Jesus and what's available and I don't care. I want to keep living the way I want to live. And so the thing that makes it unforgivable is choosing to reject the goodness of Jesus and the offer of salvation. And so this makes it not a, a one-time thing. You can't accidentally commit the unpardonable sin on a Tuesday when you've dealt with one too many frustrating people. It makes it a lifelong choice to consistently and persistently ignore and deny the work of God in your life. And I've had conversations over the years with people who say, hey, pastor, I just, I'm just worried that I've commit the, the unforgivable sin. I've done this really bad thing and, and I, I just don't know if, if that's the one. And if that's you, I've got, I've got two encouragements. And the first is that there is no sin that's unforgivable if it's taken to Jesus with repentance and, and, and brokenness. So if you've got sin that you're broken over, that you're like, I, I am so remorseful and repentant over this, and you take that to Jesus, you will be forgiven. Book of Romans says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So if you're taking your sin to Jesus, no matter what it is, you'll find forgiveness. But secondly, if you're in that place of being concerned that, hey, if I commit this unpardonable sin, that in and of itself is evidence that you really haven't. Because at some level, it means that there is the fear of God present somewhere in your life. Because people that are in this place of, of intentionally rejecting God and denying his goodness don't care if they've commit the unpardonable sin. So what, what Jesus is wanting to remind us of is that there is forgiveness available. That, that one-time forgiveness of salvation, that ongoing forgiveness of when we sin, when we fall short, when we mess up, but then he ends by reminding us that, that when we fear God, we find help. See, it's kind of interesting. Jesus, he's talking through this, and all of a sudden he starts talking about sparrows. And he's like, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? And you're like, what do sparrows have to do with any of this? What is a sparrow anyways? And he uses this, and he talks about the, the, the tiny value that these sparrows rec represent. They're not even worth a penny apiece, he's saying. And yet it says that God knows and cares about them. So if God knows and cares about these small birds of, that are insignificant, the implication is how much more does he care about us? And he continues by saying, yes, God even knows the number of hairs on our heads, which my hope is that as I age, I continue to make that a challenge for God to count them and not make it easier. <laughs> but, but it says... Jesus is reminding us, like, hey, look at the value that you have, the meaning that you have before the God of the universe, that he cares enough about you to know you intricately and intimately. And, and he, he continues by, by talking uh, about how when we go before the, the, the synagogues, he says, hey, don't be afraid if you're taken before the synagogues and the rulers and, and questioned about your faith because the Holy Spirit will, will be with you. And, and the implication of that is that that we find help, that because God loves us and knows us and cares about us, that we also find help and find love from the, the, the God who saved us. See, the, the comparison would be, hey, if, if you got arrested for being a Christian, you were thrown in jail and, and your trial started and it was streamed all over the internet for people to watch all day long and not get any real work done like we saw recently, and everyone's watching your trial and they're asking you questions about your faith, and maybe the idea of that get, makes you a little uneasy. He's saying, hey, don't be afraid of that because the Holy Spirit's gonna show up. And the direct implication is that the next time a friend or family member or coworker says, hey, what about this Bible thing? What, what's the Bible have to say about this? Or hey, what's, what's the deal with Christianity over here? 
You don't have to be afraid because the Holy Spirit's going to show up and help you. But bigger picture, it's that reminder that when we choose to fear God and walk in a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, dwells within each and every one of us. He shows up to help us, to guide us, to teach us, and, and lead us in our life so that we're not alone in the things that we face so that we're not alone in our depression, we're not alone in our financial struggles, we're not alone in our, our health diagnosis, we're not alone in dealing with our past hurts and, and issues, because the Holy Spirit is with us. And see, this is what makes it different, living for the fear of God versus the fear of people. See, when we live for God's approval, we find that, that companionship, that, that that peace, that help that we're looking for, but when we live for the approval of people, we often find ourselves empty and alone and disappointed and frustrated. And see, living for the fear of God is also what helps us overcome the tangible fears that we experience. Because we understand that no matter what we're afraid of, if we're afraid of heights or spiders or we're Indiana Jones and we're afraid of snakes, like, or we're afraid of bigger things, like failure and abandonment and hurt in relationships, we know that God is with us, that we're not alone, and no matter where we navigate to, we have the strength of God on our side. So today, what are you afraid of? Or maybe better asked, who are you afraid of? Are you living for the, the, the approval of people? Are you living in fear of, of what they think? Or are you living in the fear of God? Are you living with that healthy fear of God, wanting to, to find his approval and his affirmation? And it would be our prayer that you would live for God. And that as you do that, you would find freedom from your fear, knowing that, that God is with you, and that God is good, and he is powerful. But also that you would find purpose in glorifying God and enjoying him forever. Because we are created to live for God and to fear him and find joy and purpose in that relationship. So today, it's my prayer that you would fear God and live for him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that you love and care about us. And God, as we wrestle with fear, maybe the fear of tangible things that exist in our world, the fear of intangible situations or possibilities, as we wrestle with the, the tension of trying to, to win the approval of people, whether it's our family members or our coworkers or the, the people online or wherever it is, God, I pray that you would help us to live for you and to live for your affirmation and approval beyond anything else. God, help us to fear you not in fear and trembling and anxiety, but in honor and respect and reverence, saying, God, you have done so much for us, we want to live for you. God, help us as we do that, as, as the, the temptation pulls us back to live for people. God, help us to consistently live for you and find freedom and joy and belonging in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.